yeah, get it on. Got to get on a choice, but to get on mandate. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks to a friend. I love that about you. Chris Max Paz in studio right now. Kirk Cameron in studios. Got a book out. Pride comes before the fall. I want to get all into it. It's a children's book. And if anyone wants to feel old, Kirk Cameron has been married for 31 years. That's right. So how old are we? <laughs> I don't know how old you are, but I'm 53 this year. And we've been married for 32 years. Wow, 32 years. Yeah. Jesus, I'm so old. I can't believe, I, I'm, I'm grand, being a grandpa is right around the corner for me. We've got six children. And right. so I told, my, I told my kids, look, you're all one year apart. And so when you move out of the house, I want at least one year alone with mom again. So right. that we can travel and have a great time. Because once the grandkids come... She's going to be all over them and leave me in the dirt. Yes, yes. So I, I want a year, and I've got that year window right now. So what am I doing sitting here with you, Adam? I need to be yeah, with my wife. You should be at home luxuriating with your <laughs> wife. <laughs> right. Um, the children's book, Pride Comes Before the Fall. I, I talk about pride all the time. Now, just so we are on the same page and everyone understands where, where I'm at, I'm essentially atheist agnostic but atheist but when they start talking about we got to tear down the 10 commandments from in front of the courthouse i'm like no everyone should fucking study that and memorize it and live accordingly and they go what are you some kind of baptist preacher i go no no those are the rules atheists are not born again doesn't matter who Jehovah, I don't care who you are. Study those rules and let's have a good society. Yeah. So I am down with many, many pieces of religious doctrine because it makes sense for society. It's not really about a deity or belief or anything. It's about loving thy neighbor and the golden rule and like all, yeah. all the stuff that we've forgotten about. And that's why we're falling apart as a nation. Yeah, man, preach. <laughs> so, uh, and I and I love hearing you say that because it's it's absolutely true. And I've heard quite a few atheists in on social media accounts saying the exact same thing. In fact, Benjamin Franklin, who was one of the most irreligious, uh, as we know him to be, of our founding fathers, also said that. It, it was Christianity in the air. It was the biblical ethos and moral standard that allows us to have the kind of liberty and freedom to be an atheist in a country and not have your head cut off or be a, a minority of some sort and, and, and not go with the major religion and still have the liberty to do so. So – it, it is really important. And I, I'm a recovering atheist, atheist myself, so I'm, I'm happy to be here and, and honored to talk to you. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting time that we're living in because the script has been flipped. So I'm a little older than you. I come from a sort of hippie, California, progressive um, movement mom. And my mom, my grandma, they're all very anti-establishment, almost almost communist and stuff like that. And they were, in terms of flipping the script, so I hear the masterpiece Cake Baker out of Denver, Colorado. He's a deeply religious man. He doesn't want to bake a gay wedding cake or a transition cake. And I go, good, that's his business. And they go, what are you, you're an atheist. I was like, yeah, that's his business. That's this country. That's his prerogative. We shouldn't be able to force him to do something he doesn't want to do, even if we disagree with it or we don't share the same religion. Um, my mom growing up, my grandmother growing up, everybody on the left, everyone who was an atheist, very deep suspicions about the government, about the military establishment, about the DOJ, FBI, CIA. Now you turn on CNN and they're all applauding the DOJ. They're all applauding the FBI. They're all applauding the CIA. They're all applauding big government. And they are the progressives. They are the atheists. Like what happened that the script got completely flipped? That was never how it was. The Republicans, the right wing and the religious folks were all pounding the drum for the FBI and the CIA and all big government, all that kind of stuff. And it was the hippies that were pushing back against it. Now they're applauding the CIA yeah. and the FBI. That's never yeah. happened in this country's history. Yeah. That's fascinating, isn't it? I'm so, I'm so glad that you're bringing that up and you're saying it the way that you are because we, we scratch our heads and go, yeah, yeah, you're right. And, and I think once the, 
the power gets shifted to the other side, all of a sudden they want to use it too to enforce their dogma. It's sort of replacing one orthodoxy with another. Right. And so it's not that um, they're irreligious, it's that secular humanism can become the system that ends up becoming the god of the new establishment. And right. public schools become the established churches of the secular state. The public school system and the folks that relentlessly support it is one of the greatest examples of government, big unions, and the sort of big state in wild hypocrisy, wild hypocrisy, which is if you are a person that has two brain cells that rub together, you should be for school choice, you should be for vouchers, you should have the money follow the kid. Any First things first, we've all established, whether it's the bullet train that's going from Merced to Oakland or whatever it is, or it's the homeless situation in California, $200 billion later, and we have more homeless. The government's not great at solving problems with money. So when you say, well, there's 52 schools in the Baltimore school district where 0% of the kids can do math at grade level, we need another $5. I'm like... I don't see any straight line between your fine. Now, I see competition is solving a lot of these problems. I see the free market is solving a lot of these problems. And there's nobody who wouldn't agree with that with a with a straight face unless they were in deep with the teachers unions. And look no further than COVID. They're calling the shots. They're shutting down schools. It's all union money that's going to the Democratic governor. Why isn't this not blatantly apparent to everybody, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on? And the people that get hurt the most are the poor black and brown kids who you guys never stop talking about, except for this is damaging them. You're saying all the all the quiet as an atheist. <laughs> yes. I, I love – this is why everybody loves listening to you. Um, and, and I love that you're taking the practical outworkings of the biblical structure of government and the Judeo-Christian moral standard, like you mentioned earlier, the Ten Commandments. And when you begin applying that to the real world, stuff works better. And you're absolutely right. If, if you go to that same ancient Hebrew source, what you find is that – Education was never meant to be a job for the federal government. This is something that ought to be led and guided by the family. And so if you want school choice for your kids, if you want to homeschool your kids, you want to go to this private school, or you want to have a community publicly funded school, well, let's do that because parents love their kids and know them best and if we do our jobs as moms and dads, we can help guide their education in a way that will help them flourish far better than a government bureaucracy 3,000 miles away with all of this money that's being taken from us to do a job that they say they can do better than we can as parents. That's just not true. That's why I make documentaries like The Homeschool Awakening, and we've homeschooled our kids. We've sent them to private school. I went to public school. My dad's a public school teacher. And when, you, when it all settles down, it's a net negative today trying to get the government to do sacred and important jobs like educating your children and a whole bunch of other stuff is much better taken care of, like you said. Um, when you have a moral standard and you have the money close to you and you can solve problems locally. Well, yeah. First thing, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that you are going to make better decisions for your children sort of micro than a big overladen federal bureaucracy would make for your kids. I always say, what if there was something just called government taco? We're taking over tacos. We're giving it all the federal government. No more food <laughs> trucks, no more bistros, no more, no, 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 the government's handling tacos. How shitty would those tacos be? The worst. How fast? And the meat would be gray. They'd be flavorless. There'd be things. Would, I'd want corn tortillas, and that would be held up on the Senate floor for the last four years because they've someone filibustered. Never like, gonna happen. It would be the worst. Why are tacos? The taco game <laughs> in Southern California went from basically when I was growing up in SoCal. You had Taco Bell, you had Noggles, you had King Taco. It was all, you know, ground 
crappy beef, you know, flavored beef or whatever. It is through the roof now. Competition. That's right. Co- it's only competition that is the tide that raises all those boats. And I, and you can laugh at me and go, well, tacos, education. No, it's the exact no, it's the same, same motivating thing. force. It's the exact same. It's competition. That's what creates this. Find any government that just does a government car. It's always a pile of crap, some two-stroke yeah. cardboard box, right? The reason cars are incredible is because Audi's got to do duke it out with Volvo, Mercedes, Ford, everything. Everything benefits. We benefit the most as the consumer. And we could be the consumer of education and benefit this way as well. Now, there is zero logical reason why they're fighting against school choice other than political. 100%. 100% political, 100% big union, 100% money coming from that union. Why is that not more transparent to the average citizen of California, for instance? I Well, you know, I, I can't read everybody's mind, but the people that I talk to, these are parents who are believing the – the party line, they're drinking the Kool-Aid that is coming down from the media that says education is too important. You're not an expert. You're not licensed to do this. You don't have the degree we do. So we'll educate you. Um, the, the problem is, is that we see the results. And the problem is you, you put your kids through a, a moral meat grinder in the process with a system that is by design teaching your children not how to think, but what to think and to obey the rules. And if you go back to John Dewey and you go back to Horace Mann in the very beginning of public education, you find that this was a model that would allow them to essentially raise, disciple, indoctrinate the children of America to ultimately become obedient little Um, servants of the state. And if you take kids seven, eight hours a day away from their parents and you do this and you send them home to be, uh, you know, clothed and fed and go to sleep and send them back, you've essentially got a little government camp that will turn them into little lemmings of the state. We're talking about Animal Farm. We're talking about 1984, Brave New World. And now we're seeing the results of all of this come to fruition. I had this conversation with somebody yesterday. I've repeated it on the show, although it's been a little while. He said, what, what's up with the schools and all the super woke this and all the 1619 it's working. project? Their plan's and, coming together. And uh, yeah, and uh, drag queen story hour and stuff. And I said, it's crate training. You have to get the puppies when they're young and you have to crate train them. You have to crate train them. That's all COVID was. COVID was a dress rehearsal for 100%. crate training the puppies. There's no other explanation to COVID. They knew it didn't affect kids early. And if they didn't, they should all be removed from their jobs. They knew it. They knew statistically it was a zero burger and they crate train the kids. My, uh, my son pulling his mask up and down, getting yelled at every day, having to eat outside in the rain when they had a new cafeteria, but they wouldn't let him. I said, they getting to the kids early. Somebody got smart. And they said, for, for 50 years, they said, look, we'll catch them in college. We'll catch them in college, and we'll start polluting their mind in college. But we'll catch them in college. And then someone said, yeah, but sometimes when you're 18, you're already kind of set. Maybe you grew up with a dad and a mom that had some principles and God-fearing or whatever. No, no, no. Catch them in the first grade. That's right. Crate train them in the first grade, and then you will have a trained puppy middle age and elderly dog your entire life. That's exactly right. And we see that throughout history. That has always been the case. That's why they always go after the kids. Uh, to, to, to use an extreme example, if you listen to quotes from Adolf Hitler, uh, and it's always scary going into a, a quote with Adolf Hitler uh, because he was such a wicked man, but listen to what he said. He said, I don't care about my detractors. I have your children in my youth camps, in my schools, and in 30 years... You'll be gone, you adults, and this will be the only community that they've ever known. Crate right. trained as puppies. Right, right. And I, I think, you know, if, if, for those who think this is uh, hyperbolic, right. it is not. It is not. They're, they knew what was going on with COVID, and it was a perfect dress rehearsal to crate train the kids. Well, all the reports are coming in now that 
that you're right. I mean, all the the, the test scores are dropping, all the, the math, depression, reading, suicide, depression. fentanyl yeah, addiction. Like, like yes, they don't. Uh, well, that's the, the the comedy is they don't care about the kids. Yeah. They need as much as Hitler cared about the youth. Like they need useful idiots for their campaign. That's what they're doing. Which is, uh, ironically, um, I, I think that concerned and caring moms and dads can now take a lesson from those who are trying to take your kids away from you and let that remind you how important it is that you lean into your kids when they're little and talk to them, read them stories, teach them everything that you want them to know when they're little so that you can train them up in the way that they should go to love their family, love their country, be good citizens, love God, and don't waste those little years by outsourcing your parenting to a government institution like a public school. Now, again, my dad was a public school teacher, so are my grandparents, and there's some good ones out there, but they won't be for long because the system has been fundamentally hijacked. The pipes are filled with all the garbage, and it's coming down from the top, and you won't be able to keep it good for long. No, and it's it's barely it's barely good now, and it's 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 abundantly apparent what's happening. It's very evident what what's happening, but. It's also funny the time we're living in, which is um, just the other week, they had this whole free speech, big tech, you know, we had the whole judge ruling that uh, the government really couldn't collude with big tech and call the shots. And the thing that I find so interesting about this chapter that we're living in is I get what the government is doing. I understand what the government is doing. They say... Well, we're in charge and we'd like to be in charge of Twitter and we'd like to be in charge of Facebook and we'd like to be in charge of all the way people get information because we have information to put out and we don't want a dissenting voice. So we have a narrative on COVID. Our narrative is shut schools, six foot distancing, mask up, shots work. You never have. This is a, a pandemic of the unvaccinated. We have a doctrine. We have a doctrine. Now, they happen to be wrong about all of it. They're just wrong. Now, you can go stupid or liar, which is a game I like to play. I think they're lying. But they had a theme. And then when somebody like Jay Bhattacharya and some of these other guys with the Great Barrington Declaration said, hey, uh, I don't think it's a good idea to close schools. I think what you need to do is you need to take vulnerable people. You need to focus on them. Elderly, isolate, keep the schools open. That all got pulled off of Twitter. That all got censored. That's the way the government likes it. Now, the part that I can't reconcile is when some judge goes over 155 pages and goes, there is countless examples of the government getting involved, shutting down free speech, taking people who, by the way, turn out to be right. But that's not even the argument. That's just the cherry on top of the Sunday. Yeah, the Great Barrington Declaration was right, but that's not the argument. The argument is, is should the government be taking down voices that disagree with them and sides and says the government should not have that choice? Then you turn on CNN and the journalists on CNN, the journalists on MSNBC, the journalists at the LA Times, the Times, the journalists are siding with the government and angry that they're not in charge of Silicon Valley and free speech. That's the scary part. We're, that's the scary part of this chapter. You so-called journalists are against whistleblowers. And they're influencing. Yes. That's insane. And by the way, you no longer have to listen to them. These are the chilling and sobering final stages of a republic that is on the brink of being overthrown, going over the cliff, <clears throat> being completely infiltrated and hijacked. That's why I'm so excited to be alive right now. I'm so excited to be talking to you. We're in the middle of the story right now, Adam. And I believe that the author of the story has got a fantastic ending to this whole thing and that we get to play the role of, of a hero or a villain in the middle of the story. And I think you're one of the heroes. And I, yeah. think, I, and I think that you get some of the operating principles. I just want you to know the author of this story a little bit better 
Because I think once you get there, that supercharges all of your efforts. Uh, but we can talk more about that later. What, what, what I am experiencing right now is exactly what you're saying. I'm reading children's books of virtue, love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, humility, to children in public libraries. I first had 50 woke libraries deny me from coming to do a story hour when they previously held it, held and sponsored drag queen story hours for children. These are right. got dudes in drag, some of them um, being lewd and indecent in front of children. And I called them out and said, that's viewpoint discrimination. This isn't China. This is the United States of America. And if you continue doing that, I'm prepared to assert my constitutional rights in court. They reversed course. I went to the Indianapolis downtown public library and 3,000 parents and children showed up at that library and overwhelmed all six floors to the point that they were passing fire codes and they went down the escalator, they were out the front door and the line stretched down the street, demonstrating that there are thousands, if not millions of people who think like we do, who value what we're talking about and they don't wanna be marginalized and silenced by this, this woke machine. They want to deactivate it. Yeah, it's very telling to me by I I know they're all sort of morally bankrupt and have a agenda because of who they're attacking. So, you know, you go, well, Dr. Fauci and the head of the uh, Walensky. school, Walensky oh, and the Wine school Garden. team in Weingarten, okay, they, they, they have their take on COVID, fine. And then there's a very esteemed epidemiologist from Stanford, and he has this other take, and then they go out and attack him. And I'm like, why are you attacking somebody? He's credentialed, he's experienced. And there are many of them, but you're attacking all of them. But why are you attacking them? Why are you not making your point to the public? That's right. that's my point. I always used to say about Fauci, Rochelle Walensky, all these fucking carpetbaggers. I would say to him, you go on CNN and MSNBC and you talk about the problem with COVID is the Trump supporters and MAGA nation who's not getting vaccinated. And it's a it's an epidemic of the unvaccinated. OK, that's fine. You go on everyone's podcast and everyone's TV show. Why don't you go hop on Tucker Carlson's show and tell his much bigger audience, who is the audience you want to reach, who are not getting vaccinated, go on there and make your case for getting vaccinated. You don't, you're on Rachel Maddow's show for the 15th time in 13 days. You don't think her crowd is vaccinated? And you're saying it's the other crowd that's not vaccinated. So go, so you're basically, you're inside of Yankee Stadium, and you're saying the problem isn't anyone who's in this stadium right now. The problem is Boston Stadium, but I won't go to Boston Stadium, which holds 10 times the capacity as Yankee Stadium in this scenario, and talk to them. And the reason I won't do it is because you're going to get some pushback from the host instead of a good ass licking, which is what you get over on NBC, and you don't have enough science to support your side of this equation. That's right. If, if you don't have the intellectual backing, you start attacking the person <clears throat> and you start hiding. Um, we like rich, robust, intellectual discourse and debate in this country. That's how we learn. That's how I learn. I listen to two people and I, and I learn how to think and critically think. Yes. Um, I, was the, the, I was talking to Dr. Drew on the ride in and he said, we're talking about this craziness, you know, <laughs> And what we were talking about was the fact that the people who got everything wrong about COVID have the temerity to stand up and go, we need to maintain control over these outlets so we can give you more information for the next pandemic. And the people who got everything right and got pulled off of, of Twitter and Facebook and everything else need to be silenced for the next one. I was like, wow, you, you can say what you want about these people, but those are brass balls, right? Yeah. And but. In this vein, Drew said, what do you think we got wrong about COVID? What did we get wrong? And he, he said, I think my batting average about 85%, you know, our batting average, but average about 85%. I said, yeah. And we both sat and searched for, like, we were actively looking for things we got wrong. 
I said, you're kind of a big fan of Fauci for way too long, Drew. And he's like, yeah, I kind of got that one wrong. But even that one he got wrong, he ended up being right in the terms of people that are being pulled off of Twitter. And I said, uh, Adam Schlesinger from Fountains of Wayne died, and I thought he must have had some pre-existing condition to die of COVID at a fairly yeah, young age. Yeah, right. And right. I was like, I think I got that wrong, but I still don't know. I didn't really. Been, it's still unknown. Yeah. So I'm a little dubious and suspicious, but like, we were sitting around thinking of things we got wrong. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's what you need to do. I would call Drew all the time during COVID with like my ideas. And I'd go, Drew, tell me what I'm wrong about. This is what I'm thinking. But you tell me what I've screwed, screwed up on this. Well, why do you, like, using these sports analogies, why doesn't the scoreboard matter anymore? It doesn't. I don't know. I, I think because, in general, they own the microphone, and so they can just say what they want, and they can just say it doesn't matter they anymore, and people the, are just like, oh, yes. I, yes. I think they, owe the, they own the scoreboard. Yeah. <laughs> they just go, we just got whipped right. by 12 runs. That's go right. ahead and just change it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Another digit on there. I, I don't I, know can, what's going on. An example that, that I'm, I, I began dealing with today, because we just sent a letter to um, to an independent government agency that is over the ALA. So the ALA is the American Library Association. And what we found is uh, uh, coming up this summer, August 5th, uh, I'm hosting an event with my publisher, Brave Books, called See You at the Library. And I'm encouraging the public to visit their local library and read whatever book they want to their kids. Stuff that they want to discuss with their children in terms of values in our country. And the American Library Association so dislikes me and what I stand for, I don't know, love, joy, peace, kindness, humility, that's what my books are about, uh, that they have gone out and publicly through a video began to instruct libraries across the country to put the kibosh on the Kirk Cameron thing and giving them ways to do it, like sh like don't offer any space that day. Or if you do want to keep space open, maybe you've got all these programs that have filled up all of your reading rooms so that nobody can get in. So community members cannot go to their own library and host a story hour for their own kids because they don't like the values of conservatives or uh, Christians or Jews or, or, or whatever it is. And so this is now coming down from the, from the top levels that are funded by the government. The Institute for Library and Museum Services is funding the ALA, which is now conspiring to deny access to public libraries based on viewpoints they disagree with. Yeah. Which is it's discrimination. Insane. Yeah. I, it's, it's, it's not only is it insane, but it is coming from the crowd who traditionally said, let your freak flag fly, That's diversity. Right. By the way, how many times has Joe Biden said diversity is our strength? That's right. He thinks diversity is pigment in your skin. But he, he loves all the different colors of people, but he hates the thoughts. Yeah, you know what? You know what that is needs. not diversity, you old fart. Yeah, for this, like, it, I think the name Kirk Cameron hurts the case when you're doing something like this. Because if you explain this, uh, the see you at the library event again, but imagine Lizzo's throwing it. <laughs> like, yes, if Lizzo was throwing it, they'd all be staunch supporters of yeah. it. But it isn't, it isn't it just the height of hypocrisy for those who scream the loudest about book burnings or book bannings, I should say, are the ones who are the most intent on book bannings. Yeah, that, right. that script was flipped too. It's always. That, but here's the good news. The good news is uh, I get to be on the Adam Carolla show talking about this. You, you're talking about it every single day. And to, to uh, coin some terminology from the Lord of the Rings, the message has gotten back to the Shire. Yes. And the hobbits are beginning to assemble for battle. Nerding, but I get it. Boner. That's right. And, <laughs> well, it, it the, and the, the orcs, I believe, will not win the, if the hobbits come together. This is the time we're living in. And Dawson, the reason I was talking to Drew is I'm basically at my three year anniversary of that Newsweek article where I was discussing uh, my tweet, my famous, my infamous tweet. There's a new- Oh, I saw it. I think I saw it. It's that, great. Yeah. I, I love it. I love retroactively going back and making fun of all these idiots. But and we can get into that in a second. But here's, what, here's the age we're living in. We had four years of Trump, and we had four years of every person on CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, USA Today, uh, certainly LA Times, New York Times all talking about the corrupt president, his corrupt family members, and the grift 
about his sons, his daughters, and the basic Trump crime syndicate family who was on the grift, you know, hustling money, shaking people down. All right, it was four years of that. Now we have your guy. We have CNN's guy. We have LA Times guy. He's in the office. He is doing a on creatine supersized version of everything you accused the last guy of and found no evidence of. He literally, and, and they're bringing receipts. We got emails, we got texts, we got computers, we got whistleblowers, we got former business partners of doing exactly what you said the other guy did and you are either saying nothing about it or defending it. So, unfortunately, as a viewer, you've now tipped your hand to me. And I do not believe you about things like COVID or things about Joe Biden anymore because you're no longer an independent news organization. You have shown me who you are. It's undeniable. I don't know why you want to, want to play that fast and loose with your business model, but you did. And now we're all aware of it. That's you know what you're reminding me of is uh, in, in the Wizard of Oz when uh, when 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 Dorothy finally gets up there and she sees the curtain pulled back and the great and powerful Oz is right. just this insecure, scared little man spinning the wheels and the dials trying to make you think, right? And you go, wow. I, I think that's what we all need to see is what's behind the curtain, and we have a, 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 an elite group of people that want to have a fundamentally different America, and it's not progressive. I mean, look, if we know anything about history, this is all regressive ideas going back to the way things have always been throughout history, where all power and force has been wielded by a few at the top, and yes. everyone else becomes their slaves. That's what America was birthed for. This hope of lasting liberty began in the wilderness 3,000 miles away from the tyrants in Europe. And they came over with these ideas that were deeply influenced by the Reformation. And in the 17th century, they began forming these little colonies like the, the pilgrims in Plymouth and others. And they formed them based on ideas that they were now reading in the Bible for the first time in history that they could own and read in their own language that taught them how to organize their families, their communities, their churches, and their civil government. And it worked, it flourished. They weren't perfect, but they worked together and they had their own independence. And that was the seedbed, the roots that actually gave birth to our constitution. It wasn't the founding fathers, it wasn't the enlightenment. It was those early colonists who understood the principles you began talking about at the beginning of this show which were the Ten Commandments. And more than that, the very structure of government, which would, which would break the government into three branches. You would have a jury by trial from your own peers. You would have private property. You would have human rights. You would have all of these things that were reasoned from this ancient source. And when people try to undermine that by saying, get God out of government. Uh, they were a bunch of atheists, agnostics, and deists who didn't have a respect for God. They were trying to remove all that. No, even the most irreligious of the day understood that these principles, which came from the ancient scriptures, were indispensable supports, as Washington put it. True religion and virtue cannot be excised if they are all of this freedom becomes dangerous for people because they'll use it for themselves rather than loving their neighbor. And then it will create chaos and the long arm of the law from the top's got to come down and bring order again. And that's what will happen in this country if we don't get back to our roots. Yeah, the part that's uncanny is when I hear people like you speak and I hear people like me speak or Dennis Prager speaking or Ben Shapiro or even Joe Rogan and everyone. Everyone is just clamoring for freedom. We're, just, we're talking about freedom and then called totalitarian. Like Gavin Newsom locks down California, shuts beaches, destroys kids' lives, shuts schools, and then starts talking about freedom. And that's the part that's uncanny <laughs> to me. Everyone I know who's conservative just talks about rights and freedom. That's all they talk about. They're not, they don't say, put me in charge and I'll show these people how it works. Like, they're like, 
I don't want to be in charge. I want to be left alone. That's right. And yet somehow somebody wags their finger at them and goes, oh, so you're against freedom. It's like that never comes out of their mouth. Look no further than COVID. I don't know airborne diseases any more than I know Arabian horses. I just was concerned about freedom. I didn't I didn't say all I said was don't lock everyone down. Give them their freedom. Why does that make me dangerous? And then you get to be the hero who shuts schools for two years and bulldoze the skate parks at the beach. That's the twisted. That's the twisted part of this whole like you're pointing out Ron DeSantis is a totalitarian dictator when he said, I want to open things up. Why is why is opening things up the antithesis? It is of it is freedom. It's not control. It's it's insane. And I guess everything is projection. Is everything just projection now? Like whatever it is you're doing. Seems like you just point the finger at the other guy and go, that's that's what you're doing. Yeah, I think so. I think I think so. If our if our philosophical feet are planted in thin air, I think if we've got some some objective standards that we voluntarily uh, adhere to, like uh, it's wrong to kill people, life is an important thing, uh, liberty, uh, the pursuit of happiness, these things that we have in our constitution, and, and and moral standards, like you mentioned earlier. I think if we if we can stick with those and, and, and agree on definitions, then I think we can get somewhere and cover some ground. Otherwise, it's it's nineteen eighty four double speak. I agree. It's the ministry of words. It's all what does it's love all really circle mean? Talk double speak. <laughs> I agree. It, it's, it's driving me nuts. We have a. Uh, We'll take a break, but we have the about the three-year anniversary of this great Newsweek article that I was reading the other day. I want to go back into history because because you grew up where I grew up, and I, and I want to I want to go back into the recesses of your teenage mind and talk about some of my favorite things of growing up in the San Fernando Valley. Oh, Ooh. oh, let's see that. I grew up at Roscoe and, and Shoop, baby. You know where that is. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'd want to live on Roscoe and Shoop. Well, I did. Uh, so I grew up uh, basically. Laurel Canyon, Colfax, okay. yeah. you know, Riverside. City, all of that. Yeah. I didn't quite make it into Studio City. I was kind of a North Hollywood. North Hollywood. Magnolia, Laurel Canyon so kind of. And the only reason I know Oxnard, that. Oxnard, <laughs> Laurel. Because I did growing pains at the Warner Brothers lot. Oh, right. Which was right there in like Toluca Lake area. Well, let's right. take a little walk down uh, yeah. memory lane and also play that. Uh, we'll also read that Newsweek article because I, I have an interesting... You know, the thing about stuff like that, they write a horrible article about you and you read it and you're sort of like, well, all right. Then you go back and reread it a year later and you start to find like little subtleties in it. And then you read it two years later and you go, oh, there's a theme that I didn't catch on. I caught on. But I'd be, out, yeah. I'd be curious like what you guys, your take was on it. And that and, and memory lane with Kirk Cameron Ooh. right after this. Let me tell you about Turo, innovative. It's the world's largest car sharing marketplace with Turo. You can book any car you want, wherever you want, from a community of local hosts. Browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget. Book an SUV or a minivan for a family road trip, a pickup truck for some errands, or even test drive an EV. Every trip is backed by liability insurance. Terms, conditions, and exclusions apply. Find your drive. Forget your boring rental cars at Turo, T-U-R-O dot com. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. How much time do you spend taking care of other people? Seems like everyone needs something from you these days. Oh, man. Do I feel that vibe? Well, that can leave us feeling burnt out. And therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life and help support others without leaving yourself behind. So take care of yourself with better help. Uh, listen, therapy is a super important part of life. And if you're thinking about starting therapy, give better help a try. It's entirely online. It's convenient. It's flexible. You just fill out a brief questionnaire and you'll get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Get your head together. The body will follow with better help. Right, Dawson? Find more balance with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash Corolla today to get 10% off your first month. That's better help. H E L P.com slash Corolla. 
Kirk Cameron's in the studio. Pride comes before the fall. Of course, you know him from Growing Pains all those years and many, many other programs. And two uh, nominated for two Golden Globe Awards. Not too shabby. Um, so, old thoughts about the San Fernando Valley. Mm-hmm. So I grew up around uh, like Topanga Canyon and Roscoe, essentially, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. R- right there. That's, and that's pretty deep valley. That is deep valley. And not a lot going on back in the day no. out there. Not A lot of open lots and yeah. dirt and stuff. Yeah. yeah, we had a place that we would ride our, our, our BMX bikes in these open lots. One was called the Horse Trails mm-hmm. at the end of Valley Circle and Roscoe. Anyway, um, I love growing up out in the valley. Yeah. I, I don't live there now, but I, but I love growing up. Some of my favorite things... Uh, were, well, do, do you remember uh, Foster's Freeze ice cream? Yes, oh, yeah. yes. The dip, the chocolate dip. The chocolate the soft dip. Swirl. The, and the ice cream was like, you know, 10 inches tall on the big one. And they would dunk the whole thing in chocolate and you get this beautiful frozen shell on top of it. Yeah. And we always got that Sunday mornings after we were coming home from the beach. That was our mm. Sunday ritual as kids is we would body surf at the beach, come back sunburned, covered in sand. And my dad, if we were good would stop at Foster's Freeze. Your dad would drive you over the hill through yep. Topanga or yes, the 405? Topanga. Well, we begged him not to go through Topanga because you wanted to throw up by the time you got to the yeah, other end. Yeah. so sick. windy. You were car yeah. sick. Yeah. And would you go to Will Rogers Beach? Bro, you're throwing me back. I can't <laughs> believe this. Yes, we went to Will Rogers Beach. We also went to Sorrento Beach, mm-hmm. which was right next to the pier. Right. So they have it's basically Santa Monica... Then it's uh, Will Rogers or Sorrento, then Will Rogers. Then it starts to bleed into Malibu, yeah. and then that gives way to Zuma. That's right. And then right. after that, you're on your own. You're, you're heading you're to Ventura. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, man, we, we loved that. Oh, my gosh, that was one of my favorite things. Another favorite place we would go was Farrell's Ice Cream. Oh, Farrell's. Do you remember that? Yeah, there were a couple of Farrell's. There was one in the Deep Valley yeah, where you that's were. that's where we were. Maybe one in, like, Van Nuys, off of Van Nuys and- Boulevard. I remember... Okay. What do you remember about Farrell's? Okay, I remember a couple things. One is, is a guy who was not high achieving scholastically in terms of schools and awards and certificates and things like that. One of my claims to fame is I finished off a pig's trough at Farrell's and got a certificate. Yeah. So so when people would talk about their undergrad degrees and their awards won for literary works and things. I would pull out my pig straw. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> which still had like fudge smeared on it and be like, I finished seven <laughs> scoops of ice cream in one sitting, bitch. Sure, so break. spare me your doctorate. <laughs> it really was a trough full of ice cream and you got this certificate that said, I made a pig of myself yes. at Farrell's Ice Cream. And do you remember the zoo? If you I remember the, the zoo, zoo. The zoo couldn't be eaten by one person. No. But, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe the guy that wins the hot dog eating contest could do it. But Joey Chestnut. Joey Chestnut. But it's, this was a huge thing called the zoo for, for a table. And they brought it out on a stretcher. And they made all this f- noise and fanfare as they, as they carried it around the store. And they had ambulance siren sounds going off. And they would deliver the zoo to the your zoo. table. All right. So here's how it would work. The zoo. Uh, so I went to Farrell's. On very rare occasion, I didn't go, my family wasn't as motivated as yours. They were poor, but they weren't proud. I was I was born in the valley, but not really bred. I was just kind of on my own. But okay. I would get to Farrell's because some kid would throw a birthday party at Farrell's. And then little Johnny was turning 11, and he's going to be at Farrell's, and everyone's coming, and we're buying a zoo. That was a big deal. And the zoo was a stretcher. Like a canvas stretch, like a World War One yeah. typey stretcher with a big hole cut out in the middle of right. it, and the zoo looked like you know, like like Wimbledon's Cup or something. Like it was like something <laughs> totally. you would win in a golf master series. So it was a big chrome, you know, it was like a it was like a Sunday Cup but that held nine gallons, you know, and it was there, and they would fill it and whipped cream and everything. And they put little plastic monkeys and little plastic figurines and stuff in it, too. Like yeah. little plastic monkeys. And they put it, and then the siren would go off. They'd put the stretcher on their shoulders and be running. For one person in front of another guy be banging a bass drum. That's right. Running by, boom, 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 boom. And you're like, oh, it's shit. The fu- yeah. Oh, my God. The, here comes the zoo. Here comes the zoo. And they'd put that thing down, and I... 
came from like a weird health food family and my mom didn't do much baking or cooking and we didn't go to Foster's or anything. So when that thing got in front, man, I was, I was boxing throwing out around elbows. the boards. I was throwing elbows and knees. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was poking guys in the eye. Like I was trying to box me like, just give me, get the, get the, get the uh, brain freeze going, go back. Cause I, that, that thing was the greatest. They had a gift shop on the way out. You could get jawbreakers, yeah. the, the jawbreakers, that's zots right, and whatever else. <laughs> oh, you're killing me! So the zoo this memory lane is awesome. It's the largest Sunday on the menu. Eight and a half pounds of ice cream. Eight and a half pounds of ice cream. <laughs> I'm telling you, what was it for? Was it for like groups that, of seven yeah. and above or something? Uh, eight and a half pounds had to be like. I mean, that's like twelve and above, right? And yeah. the the pig's trough. So did you finish your pig's trough? I I, I you didn't think finish I, your pig's I don't trough. think don't, I ever finished a full to, pig's trough. No, I no. got my <laughs> I got my certificate in the car. If you want me to go get yeah. it, <laughs> I want to see that. Show it to you. That's yeah. an accomplishment. <laughs> you know, one of my, even, my other favorite uh, uh, San Fernando Valley kid memories is In and Out Burger. Now, yeah. if, if people haven't haven't figured out In and Out Burger have is, the, now. is the best burger in the world. Um, they should, Agreed. and they've got this secret menu. And and uh, man, we I used to love In and Out Burger. I remember I was I'm kind of scarred as a little kid because I remember when I first saw the In and Out uh, logo, it was on my uncle's bathroom wall, but he had he had rubbed out urge. the B and the R. So In and was, Out Urge, right? Yeah. And I was like, Wow, why, why, why is it, I can't believe Uncle David's got this on the wall? <laughs> and it had this yellow arrow, like you People, know. They kinda, why is this a thing? I didn't. And there was In and Out Burger bumper stickers. Bumper stickers were a thing. First off. Cars used to have bumpers. They're like a separate part of the car. They weren't <laughs> oh. integrated into Heard the car. Right. Sure, right. It was like a separate chrome thing that stood out from the car. So when you put a bumper sticker on, you weren't really putting crap on your car. You're putting it on your bumper. You know That's what right. I mean? And there were, you know, KLOS, KMET, like K Rock, totally. you know, they had bump it set Union Rush. 76, right? They, they had everything. Yeah. Bumper. And they had In N Out Burger bumper sticker, which lasted a year. And then enterprising young gents like your uncle decided to modify it <laughs> into In N Out Urge, you know, in case there was a single lady behind them in traffic. Oh, they knew he was open for <laughs> business. Bat signal, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That that's Dotson right. B210. There it, is. there it is. Right. They just take out the B and the R, and that was on the that was on Uncle David's bathroom wall. And, and I, <laughs> as a little kid, I was like, I, I don't know if I'm am I doing something wrong by reading this <laughs> and, and trying to understand it. They would do the, the Toyota pickup trucks would get changed to toy, toy oh, yeah, or Yoda. That. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. A lot of That's potential right. there. Yeah, there was. A, we were bored. We didn't have stuff to do. We had to mess around with the bumper stickers. And I was so excited when I discovered the In and Out secret menu. Because right. they had stuff that's not on the menu. I mean, they got sure. burger shakes and fries, but then they got the Flying Dutchman. Yeah. What they got is the, the three flying? By, I don't know. All I know is animal style. The animal style is great. So you get extra sauce and What's you get the Flying the Dutchman. Yeah. So you can get a three by three, a four by four. You could even even more than that. You get a seven by seven back in the day. I think four by four they, is as they high only as they go, go now. Four by four now, yeah. yeah. But a Flying Dutchman is on the secret menu, and that's two slices of melted cheese between two patties, and you get a fork and a knife with it. Oh, it's and there's keto. all kinds of stuff. you can get chili peppers uh, grilled Chopped. right into your to your burger. The flying uh, Chris, did you, you know the flying cheese? Dutchman? I know the flying Dutchman. Yeah, okay, I'm scared. I, I'm gonna screw it up, and the guy's gonna think it's gay code. Next thing <laughs> you know, we're gonna end up in the bathroom, yeah. and it's gonna get out of hand. My, break, my break's in ten. <laughs> can, you think of, can you think of one that nobody knows? Uh, on you know, I saw menu? the other day. I saw somebody instead of lettuce wrapped, they got grilled a grilled onion. Oh. As their bun. As their mm. bun. Mm. Yeah, it's like just like a whole but grilled a, onion. But a, like a but full a, size a, a, a wheel. Onion. Yeah, a wheel. Yeah, exactly. Of grilled onion. You, yeah. can get it, you can get it sandwiched between two tomatoes if you want. Right. That's another one. And here's one, uh, doggy style. If you order your burger doggy style, it's actually a, a protein style grilled cheese with fries inside a lettuce sandwich. Wow. <sighs> yeah. So Don't it, order the Flying Dutchman doggy you, style. Yeah. Did you have... Then there was like A and W. Oh, loved them. Loved and, that. And the, the root beer floats were the best. They had places like weird one offers, like Dog and Suds was a place <laughs> in North Hollywood. And there was there's a place called the Wild Wiener. And there was like law dogs in, in Van Nuys where the guy gave out 
sold hot dogs and gave out legal advice. Oh, he's yeah, like, yeah. He's by the <laughs> that court. was in the news. He's by the courthouse. Man. Like, they had all these weird one-off tale of the pup, I think. They had these weird hot dog name places that never really turned into franchises that were sprinkled all over the valley, but out of range for you and your Schwinn back in the day. Like, you wouldn't have got that. How did you know I had a Schwinn? Because you're the- a winner. <laughs> it was yellow with the banana seat. Oh, you probably had Levi's and a Schwinn. I did! I had a Huffy and Tough Skins. <laughs> That's how we separate the haves from the have-nots. Don't you feel, he's on growing pains. Don't you right. feel so blessed to have grown up in that era of those late 70s and 80s? And yeah, there was a... There was a there's there's a, a magic about it. There was a thing that... So... Walking into the Schwinn shop, I couldn't afford anything at the Schwinn shop, but I liked to go into the Schwinn shop a lot. There was one on Laurel Canyon and Chandler. And I would just walk in and I would smell vulcanized rubber. I just smelt the tires of like the it. Schwinn. Yeah. And I'd just be in that like, environment. <laughs> and I would just go look at the apple crates and the slick chick and uh, all the all stingray. the stuff with the stingray, the shocks and stuff. And I'd just go, wow. Wow. And I'd just walk around. There's some air conditioning, you know, look at some stuff and then leave. Like uh, that. You that was like, let's go to the Schwinn shop. <laughs> yeah. like, but we're not we, buying anything at the Schwinn shop. We're it's not just fixing anything. It's just. It's just like saying go to the museum, except for this is a museum of cool bikes that I, I can't afford. But yeah, going into all those places. You know what something I never talk about what was a big deal when I was a kid and, and the more sort of stuff I couldn't really afford was there were hobby shops all over the place. And I'm not talking about mm. big box store. I'm talking about hole in the wall. Yeah. Like miniature little- Little local places. Little local hobby shops with like old women working behind <laughs> the, the counter. And you just, it had a smell. It's like like the hobby <laughs> shop smelled like the hobby shop. The Schwinn shop smelled like the Schwinn shop. You'd know where you were if you're blindfolded. And you'd go up and there'd be some- unobtainable thing like some electric car with three motors or something like, oh, it's always, always top shelf yeah. stuff you know $104 or something you just stare at it god yeah. damn one day <laughs> one day one and day. the smell of that glue yes. that melted that plastic testers. and put it together testers glue yes just, oh my gosh Kirk what was the coolest thing you owned when you were a kid the coolest thing I owned when yeah. I was a kid. Yeah, because you, I mean, you, you, you were fortunate wow. to be on Growing Pains. I'm yeah, sure you yeah, got yeah. some cool I, stuff. I think, the, I think the coolest thing that I thought that I owned was my boa constrictor. Whoa. <laughs> you know, and uh, I mean, I, I was, you could never catch me without a, a, a little, a, a, a a little bottle of Banaka. Remember Banaka back uh, in the day? Because right, yeah. Yeah. you had to be smelling good f- if you were going to talk to any of the girls. That's right. plus the In-N-Out stickers. And yeah. 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 <laughs> they knew you were open for business. <laughs> yeah. But I had an, aller- an allergy to cats and dogs as a kid, so we never had pets. And I took two reptiles. And I had a, a, an eight-foot boa constrictor that I fed chickens. How old were you? In my backyard. How old were you? I think I started collecting snakes when I was about nine. Live and chickens? They started out live. I'd buy them up, up in Chatsworth. <laughs> All chickens start out live. And, and then I, it's downhill. I bought, I bought them live, and uh, oh. I'd take them home, and uh, they, they would meet their demise. And My dad lived on a farm, so he showed me how to do this. And then uh, you'd feed the snakes because it takes— Would take, you pluck take, them and everything? It, no, no, no. The snakes eat the feathers. They digest all that stuff. Right. You just literally kill the chicken and throw it in there? All parts? Uh, the, the, essentially, yeah. They eat the whole chicken. And <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, but it would take, you know, dozens of mice if you were to go that route at the pet shop. So right. I went to the to the farm. The pet the pet shop. The, the pet shop shop. Boys. These are these are the places. We had a pet shop. Here here were the the stops. You had the Schwinn shop. You had a pl- place called Kit Craft near Ventura yes. Boulevard that was the big hobby store. There was hole in the wall hobby stores. You just go in there Tons and you'd of see like wood. you'd see like oh yes. the little German soldiers all painted up ah. and put together with a half track and they just look at a train set. You know there were toy stores so. Everything wasn't 70,000 square foot no. with a, you know, 40 no. foot high ceiling. Everything was like a miniature little, like th- the hobby shop was about as big as this room. You just go in, you look at a bunch of stuff. It was all independent. There would be toy stores, 
hobby shops, pet shops, and then, for good measure, the poster shop. There's a place in the mall oh, that just oh, sold the mall, the posters. Mall. Oh, you go to the, the mall, best. and you look up, and it'd be hanging there, baby. Mm-hmm. And it was a cat, you know, hanging on oh, a classic, rope, yeah. you know. Motivational, sure. And there'd be Cheryl Teagues up there in a bikini. <laughs> and there'd be, like, ones like R. Crumb, like, stoned again, where he was like, hey, smoking pot. And his face started, like, melting into his hands. And there was novelty stuff. There was CZ Rider. It was a guy in a dirt bike. Who had about 18 inches of air doing half a cross up. Like literally a cross up. A guy a on a dirt bike <laughs> with two foot of air on a dirt bike, two foot of air right. doing half a cross up. That's right. Not even a pancake, no stadium jumps, no Jeremy McGrath backflips or baby no tweet, Travis yeah. Mastrana. <laughs> CZ Rider. <laughs> CZ Rider, the most popular, one of the most popular, like. Second only to Farrah Fawcett's poster was CZ Ryder. It was a guy with barely any air doing half a cross up. It's uh, something that any 11 year old could do on a YZ80 <laughs> right now, and it was posterized. And do you remember when the, those posters that were all blurry and you had to stare at it for like five minutes for it to come into focus, and all yeah. of a sudden you see dolphins jumping out of the water? Oh, in 3D, yes. yeah. The 3D posters. Then there'd be like the novelty cards, like the oversized novelty cards. They would sell the greeting cards, like the novelty cards at the place too. And there were always a bunch of like, welcome to Malibu and a morbidly obese chick in a bikini, like standing there. There's a lot of fat chick (laughs) novelty. Like we can make a super funny card if we just take a 300 pound woman and put her in a string bikini and take a picture. Find CZ Rider. I'm telling you, if I gave that to my kid, like, hey, it's Christmas, I got you a poster. <laughs> it's a guy getting three foot of air and a CZ motorcycle doing half a cross up. He'd burn the house down. Was it, it impressive back then or was it lame? I, I, back in a day of no mono shock, no travel, kind of yeah. not that much, not that much going on, it was, it was pretty cool. It wasn't That's like, cool. oh my God. It was, it was like kind of a cool poster, but the guy wasn't doing anything he was just doing <laughs> half a cross-up i mean you have guys now going full superman yeah, i don't even know if he's airborne i don't even know if he's airborne either. There, there's guys that are 40 feet in the air at a stadium who've launched their bike in front of them and are hanging on to the rear fender <laughs> in a suit full full yeah. superman there it is okay. all right he's he's got two foot he's of air in the back <laughs> he's doing something any nine-year-old can do on a dirt bike right oh yeah. huge seller <laughs> CZ Rider. That was it. Probably didn't even land it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. You would go, it would be the mall had, the Laurel Canyon Mall had the pet store. You'd stop in there. Now, again, just like the Schwinn shop, there was no purchasing of anything. I would go visit the pets from the pet store. Like, oh, they didn't sell that cat that I was looking at last week. Yeah, How are you right. doing, Timmy? I go visit the, the cat. <laughs> it, was, it was a pet store cat. And then go to the poster yeah, shop. Well, yeah. I wandered over to the reptile aisle because I was always dreaming of one day, you know, ordering or owning a skink or a or a, or a tarantula or something like that. You know, you know where else I used to go is Chuck E. Cheese. Oh, really? I went to Chuck E. Cheese, and I, I didn't. It, I, I'm ashamed to say it, but I we used to actually steal tickets out of the skee ball machine mm-hmm. with our foot as they sort of like came out the machine down onto the floor. We'd sort mm-hmm. of swoop swoop them back behind us when the little kid wasn't looking, uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, we'd we'd cash them all in for like candy and stuff later. And uh, did you but, ever get? Let's see, you're a deep valley guy, so you never got to Henry's Tacos. No, no. that's a very sort of Toluca Lakey. Because you got to understand. Our parents, at least my parents, they weren't driving me anywhere. So my range was my Huffy. So there was no damn way I could get out to Shoop and Balboa or something no. on my Huffy. That was the hinterlands. But we did make it out to the flood control dam at Sepulveda mm. and trek all through the marshes through Sepulveda Basin, which had a weird marsh. It was like wetlands right in the middle of the San Fernando Valley. There's a whole dam off of the 170 or the yeah, 170, or the 170 and the 101. Or the 405 and right in there. And, and it was marsh. It was like swamp. You could go truck around, ride your bikes 
through did, that. Did you have to be home by the time the street lights came on? No, I didn't, my family didn't do dinner. They didn't do family. They didn't have curfews. They didn't do anything. I had to be home because all the other kids I was hanging around with had intact families who had, to, had be to be home. home. So at some point, it'd just be me standing alone, bouncing a basketball in a schoolyard <laughs> while everyone else went home to eat. And I'd be like, what I would normally do is like, hitch a ride with them like they'd go oh i gotta go home oh, yeah, i gotta eat and i'd go what's your mom serving tonight <laughs> <laughs> they'd, right. they'd go i think tonight's pork chops i'd go pork chops you got an extra couple of chops on there because i may swing by and then i would just bump draft the guy <laughs> into there because pork chops is a big ticket oh, yeah. also i know it sounds totally old school but a lot of these moms would yell from their porch uh. like Max Turex's mom is across from Colfax Elementary. We'd be playing basketball or some of the other moms. You'd, you'd hear them just like the Ricola guy out there. Just, Ricola! <laughs> and it'd be like, yeah, yeah it's yeah, 6.30. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, all right, everyone. Totally, uh, totally. Well, that's all I had we, we, we had, <laughs> my, my mom could whistle like you couldn't believe. And oh. we would just hear her whistle. Does she out, have a nationality, the... a whistling nationality? Uh, well, she's she's German. Eh, it's and not so a whistling nationality for she me. She would whistle so loud that you couldn't miss it. But if she had whistled and you weren't home within <laughs> two minutes, you were in trouble. She didn't have to be it. in sight either, right? Not you just hear it. No, if, she's not hearing it. If, if, you, if you had the streetlights on and you heard your mom's whistle, right. you, you were done. Yeah. I mean, the spatula was coming out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we'll save my Newsweek article for another show because I had too much fun talking about ferals with Kirk Cameron. Yeah. Yeah, man. Slice of life. Point in time. Pride Comes Before the Fall is the name of the children's book. Go out and support all the work that he's doing. And go to KirkCameron.com to find out about all that's going on in your life. Phil Levitt, drummer from one of my favorite bands, Dada, has a new band. Have a lot to go over with him. And he's, I believe, when I played you guys the song, I took a trip with my dad that we're laughing about on the show about dropping edibles, maybe maybe peyote or mushrooms or something, and taking a trip with his dad. He he actually did that. I think we were talking, damn, who yeah, were we, we talking about? It. Yeah, but I we were, yes, you'll remember, Frank Grillo. Come oh. on, man, I'm older than you. Frank Keep Grillo was in here, action star, with his son talking about taking edibles and going out and yeah. trekking. And I said, somebody already wrote a song about that. We have the guy. <laughs> we have the guy. We have the song. Uh, thanks, Kirk. Thank you. We'll do great, it. Great to hang out with you guys. Likewise. We'll do that right after this. Let me tell you about my friends over at Lear Capital. They're a new partner of the podcast, and I've known these guys for years because... Uh, well, I'm familiar with them. I'm from L.A. They started in L.A. and they've been around for as long as I've been around. And the fact that they've been around so long, well, it speaks to me. Makes me feel comfortable speaking on their behalf. Lear's the leader in the precious metal business and provides a great way to give your family protection and diversification. You need it. You need to diversify your portfolio. I look at owning gold the same way I look at owning my car collection over time. Both gold and the vintage cars can increase in value, and you can touch them. They're physical. It's not just a bunch of numbers on a spreadsheet. Keep it in a safe place, and it'll provide comfort knowing you can see it, hold it, touch it whenever you want. And that's how I feel about the vintage cars. Gold, to me, is king, like uh, one of my old vintage Lambos is king. So reach out to Lear Capital at learadam.com and they'll send you a free investment guide. They'll provide all the information you need to make up your own mind about having a little peace of mind right in your hands. It's easy. Go to www.learadam.com or give them a call. 800-489-6450. That's 800-489-6450. That's 800-489-6450. Let me tell you about Trust Us. Do you like having your mind open to things? Pruitt Igo was a St. Louis housing project built in the early 1950s with federal money. And the bureaucrats behind it were convinced 
they could design a building that would improve the lives of everyone living there. And all it did was create criminals. I mean, boy, if you didn't like the government before, (laughs) you watch this doc. That story is part of Trust Us, a documentary about government handing control to unelected experts from the early 20th century right through the COVID-19 pandemic. You think government experts are arrogant and have unchecked power? This doc shows you how much worse it is than you ever imagined. Trust us, free, right now on YouTube. If you're a citizen and you're a patriot, you'll watch Trust Us right now, free on YouTube. Bill Levitt is here, one of my favorite drummers. Seven Horse now, da da, in the past. Used to come on Loveline way back in the. Way back. Way back in the day. And a Valley guy, so we can keep the party going. Because the Ferrells was on Valley. Ferrells, Friday nights after football at uh, Birmingham High School. Oh, you went to Birmingham. I was the drum major of the Birmingham High School marching band. I went to North Hollywood High. Rivals. You ever have the zoo? Uh, I did not have the, have the zoo myself. I saw the zoo. I saw the stretcher. Uh, I heard the siren, the bells. The uh, that was a regular. You're for us. aware of the zoo. I'm yeah, very aware of the zoo. Yes. The uh, there's a live show coming up, hot summer night. That's it's right. West Hollywood at the Roxy Theater. That'll be August 19th. So Seven Horse going to be playing there. Plus, uh, there's going to be a set by Dada as yep. well, and then. Our own Mike Dawson's band. What? Smoking Kills going to be there. Yeah, is, somehow we got on that bill. Is, <laughs> as well. So it's going to yeah. be a big night. Big Tickets night. are going to go, and it's at the Roxy. Big is this night. the first time Dada oh. has been? When was the last time they've played? Well, Dada did a, you know, Dada on and off over the years played, uh, you know, we got dropped from a label in the late 90s. And, uh Tried to, you know, brought it back many times. Uh, I did a stint in Las Vegas on the Blue Man Group for a while. But uh, in the 2000s, we we reformed, came back, did some touring, and we played in 2017 uh, on a 25th anniversary tour that uh, almost broke up the band for good. Um, so this will be the first time since uh, the controversial 2017 reunion. Ooh. So Dada... Probably most of you most know from Disneyland, right? Which is their probably biggest hit. Yeah, I I, I could remember hearing Dada for the first time probably on K-Rock radio back in the day. And I remember hearing the song Dim and just loving the song Dim because I love the guitar riff in Dim. This is Michael, oh, that's, right? That's Mike Gurley, yeah. It's a great riff. We turned in the first version of this record and to uh, our record company, IRS Records. Miles Copeland was the was the president. It was mm-hmm. a legendary character in music, sure. the police's manager, and uh, a uh, hard-driving record executive back in the day there on IRS. And the IRS had had a ton of success with the Go-Go's and... Uh, specials. Specials, yeah. Um, He's Stuart's brother. That's right, right Stuart mm-hmm. Copeland's brother. Um so we turned the record in and uh, he rejected it. W- was not going to put it out. It had Disneyland on it. And he hated Disneyland. Right. Hated it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and basically said, look, you guys, you don't have it. You, you need to go back. And he was a very guy who was very certain about what he was saying. As all record executives right. are. He was like, you guys don't have it. You got to go back in the studio. Here's what I'm going to do. I, I give you $5,000. Or, you know, what you should do. Your name's called, your name's Dada, right? You should... Get a bunch of farm animals. I don't know. Invite your friends over and do kind of a live. We're looking at him like, are you out of your mind? Man? What, what are you talking <laughs> about? So we did go back, though, and we wrote a bunch of songs, Dim included. And then we're, we're, we're working through the song. And I, and I have to take credit for this because I did say it. Um, I was like, man, we need something to kick this thing off. Mike, you, you give us a riff or something. And he just, he just did it like right there. He's, is he a great guitar player? Yeah. All yeah. right, let's listen. 
Wait, got to go back. Go back 30 seconds because I love the song so much. It's such a great riff. It's such a great song. Thank you. I was like, God, these guys are good. I was just driving Ooh, around my good. pickup yeah. truck in yeah, uh, North band. Hollywood. And uh, I went out and got the album, and um, I love uh, Dorina. Yeah. Which I don't know who that song's about. Uh, you know, I don't either. I think it's a mythical <clears throat> girl. Uh, you know, I don't know where they got that name. It's it's long, so we won't Very do it. Yeah. But it's the same. <clears throat> it's the same thing, which is, it's it just builds and builds and right. and builds. I think there's three guitar solos in this song. So <laughs> we don't have time for that. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of solos. Yeah. Jeez. I mean, this and, and of course, this record came out right as Nirvana arrived. Mm-hmm. So it really didn't, it was really going this way when the world was going that way. That was right. the unfortunate thing about all this. Yeah, but we did manage to break through on Disneyland, but it was just not, uh, the timing was a little bit off for this kind of music. Whereas today, if it came out, it would probably just explode. Well, that 1992, that's uh, that's when we heard from bands like Toad the Wet Sprocket for the first time. That's we when did. we heard Dishwalla. Yeah. So you were still in... Um, very like-minded company, but Boy, yes, are. I can see how. The, I mean, the slate got wiped clean yeah, by uh, right. Nirvana, basically. You, you never yeah. sang in Dada. Uh, I sang a little bit. Yeah, yeah, the third voice. Yeah, you know, you hear me occasionally. Here today, gone tomorrow. I'm singing in that. They uh, another cut off now. If, yeah, if you fast forward, the best part about this song is the end. The you know, it's is, just built and built and built. Yeah, there it goes. Which, by the way, I think every song should do. Yes. <laughs> Love it. I'm surprised your label let you do that. That song's oh, yeah. six and a half minutes, at least. Right? Yeah, at least. it yeah. starts real yeah. slow as you heard it, but it ends up with that. And yeah. I was like, this band kicks ass. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I know music, and everyone else is a fucking dope, <laughs> and that's my problem. <laughs> they want to argue about fucking Paul Abdul yeah. and uh, and uh, Hot Legs and fucking. Twisted sister, like, junk. <laughs> they just want to listen to junk, and I'm like, "Why don't you listen to good music? Mm. I don't get it. Why are you eating American cheese? I got yeah. some sharp cheddar over here, bitch." Right? right. God, uh, it's you so know, sad. I mean, there's no accounting for taste. You know, music is like that. Ugh, Everybody likes their it's own so thing. It's disconcerting. I hear you, man. It's so I'm sad. Telling me, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so. um you now you, you you brushed over Blue Man. Yeah, yeah. I did a, I did a few years in Blue. Well, Dada, you know, we 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 went from IRS Records, which was a great independent label, which was a little past its prime when we got there. Uh, they went out of business while we were on the road on our third record. But uh, the president of IRS, a guy named Jay Boberg, who was partners with Miles, ended up as the running MCA Records, the Music mm-hmm. Cemetery of America, as mm-hmm. we like to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, he brought us over there. So we ended up doing a record on MCA in 1998, which uh, they couldn't figure out how to sell. And within six months, we were dropped. And at that point, um, uh, my life sort of uh, bottomed out. I, I had uh, got a divorce and went bankrupt. That was my the extent of my music career. Um, had a business manager at the time as well, which was hard to figure. But um, I fortunately uh, landed on my feet back in my uh, the place of my birth, Las Vegas, working for uh, the Blue Man Group at the Luxor Hotel uh, for three years, which was... Uh, which working was, for? Like, yeah. Were you not like, like an understudy or something? Well, I mean, I was working for Blue, Blue Man Group's uh, you know, corporation, so I was working for them. Well, I think the problem is, is you're bald. Yeah, I'm... I'm well, no, but, but, but and, I wasn't and the you Blue have, Man. It was your body you fat. Drums, so yeah. I heard you play drums, so yeah. I thought, can you play a kettle filled <laughs> yeah. with water? Yeah, no, no, but I wasn't one of those guys, because a Blue Man, you have a height requirement. I know, but too. you understand uh, if you're... <laughs> If you're five foot nine blonde and you go, yeah. I'm in the porn industry, right. people are going to go, oh, that's a He's great got, fake tits. You yeah. go, no, no, I just work sieving and uh, shipping. <laughs> like, like, you got to. You got to steer us because right. the bald head, right? No, but I wasn't. A, but I wasn't a blue man. So the blue, right. the blue men are on stage. You got to be six one to be a blue man. You do. Yeah, there's a height requirement. They Why? Have, well, because that's just the character. Oh, but you can't be six three. No, no. I mean, it's like a minimum. I think they have a range, but I think the minimum in Vegas was six one. Six I one. Think. But the mm. band no height requirement. So the, sure. the the original Luxor show. There's three blue men. A bald and blue down on stage i had hair back in these days too oh. it, it, you know, mm-hmm. I, although i did shave it when i was younger because i knew this was coming right. um but uh yeah i was in the band so we had this loft 
uh, up above the stage, and it was uh-huh. a seven-piece band with four drummers. So it was wow. a, a drum army. And wow. I was one of those guys. Did it, uh, a great gig. Let me tell you about Angie, homeowners. You know, it's a lot of work to own a home, whether it's uh, everyday maintenance, repairs, or dream projects. It can be hard to even know where to start. All you need is Angie. You're home for everything home. Find a skilled local pro who will deliver quality and experience. Over 20 years of home service experience. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app. Answer a few questions and Angie handles the rest. Look, you're busy. You don't have time to do all this stuff. Let Angie handle it. Take care of just about any home project in just a few taps. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit online. Visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. A-N-G-I dot com. That's Angie. Let them do all the heavy lifting. Hey, it's Adam Carolla. Is your vehicle not stopping like it used to? Or does it squeal? Does it shake? Does it shimmy? Does it grind when you hit that brake? Well, don't miss the summer brake deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Brake best, select, and import direct brake pads and rotors are engineered for all driving conditions to restore and improve braking performance. With application-specific friction formulas, noise-canceling shims, and uh, low-dusting operation, trust Brake Best and Import Direct to deliver better braking. It's important. It's a safety issue. And right now, you can get two bottles of O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner for only 8 bucks. See store for details. Don't take any chances on your next brake repair. The professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts will help you find the brake parts and supplies you need to do the job right the first time. So stop by your local O'Reilly Auto Parts today or visit O'ReillyAuto.com. Let me tell you about Turo Innovative. It's the world's largest car sharing marketplace with Turo. You can book any car you want, wherever you want, from a community of local hosts. Browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget. Book an SUV or a minivan for a family road trip, a pickup truck for some errands, or even test drive an EV. Every trip is backed by liability insurance. Terms, conditions, and exclusions apply. Find your drive. Forget your boring rental cars at Turo, T-U-R-O dot com. Now, trip with my dad. Mm-hmm. Do we figure out that was you? That was me on the trip. Yeah, this was a story I related to Mike Gurley, and uh, he came back with the lyrics to this song that are pretty accurate from the story that I related to him, and then the band developed them. So you said, around. here's something crazy that happened to me. Yeah, and my so dad, you wouldn't believe what happened. And he went, oh, that's good yeah, fodder for yeah, a that's, song. that's a song. Fodder about fodder. Um, mm-hmm. But it's basically a true story. Um, you know, my dad was uh, kind of of the beat generation, and a, he hitchhiked from Chicago to Venice Beach in 1960, <laughs> right. and lived on the beach and didn't shower for six months, and you know right. that's his life story. Ended up in Vegas working uh, at, at uh, the Stardust as a blackjack dealer for many years, uh, all over town, really. My grandfather was in the gambling business, came from Chicago, and um, my dad also loved narcotics, loved them, mm-hmm. loved them, and uh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> deeply. Delight. <laughs> deeply uh-huh. and uh yeah at, you know the family split up when i was 13 my mom and i moved came to la we, we lived in uh, tarzana and then in van nuys and uh i used to go back in the summertime my dad was still out there and i think i was i don't know 20 maybe 18 it might have been right around there 18 to 20 years old and he was like all right we're gonna go up to mont charleston and which is right outside of las vegas and we're going to take some LSD as uh, you know together <laughs> and <laughs> father and son bonding experience. Oh. And so that's what we did. We were at my grandmother's house and we said goodbye grandma and we got in the car and we drove up the mountains and it's only like 20 minutes you're up in the in the mountains outside. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't know that but like you can be skiing, you know, right. in Vegas in 20 minutes. And uh, we took a, a few hits of acid because one is never enough for him. And um, <laughs> it was my first time. Uh, although I had I had had some mushrooms before, but not LSD per se. Mm-hmm. 
And it came on in the mountains and, you know, the hallucination started and he was feeding into it. He's like, look at that stick over there. That's a snake. Right, you know? And he right. was really trying to get me going. Kirk Cameron and, uh, fed he, it a chicken. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so the thing really was coming on heavily and then we had to get down. Yeah. And he <laughs> developed a migraine headache. Really? And, and basically said, look, I can't drive. You have to drive down. And I'm, you know, I got, I have this going. Pinwheels for us. And I'm driving down the mountains, you know, and went back to grandma's house, just like still, still on high. acid. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, it was a, 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 a pivotal experience. It was, life, uh, so, yeah. well, we need to hear a little more because the harmonies <laughs> are still great. In this, uh... yeah, this one stuck with Adam. Yeah, I know. This really stuck deeply. I thought Adam. it was a funny story. Yeah. Is that the second record? Uh, third record. Uh, third record, I believe. Which is my favorite, by the way, of the Dot Isle. Yeah. We took his wagon. Yeah. And all of my tapes. Tapes. We were the apes. Yeah. I love this one. We started in the valley. I love it. Yeah. Headed for the clouds. We are behind mother. Do you know the three is the cloud? I took the trip with my dad. You know it made us both feel better. We talked a lot. Is Michael Gurley kind of a genius musically? Uh, some would say so. Or yeah. underrated at least? Uh, certainly underrated and a huge pain in the ass. But, uh, but, <laughs> but like a lot of talented, super talented people. I mean, he could uh, play the shit oh, yeah, out of a guitar, right? Oh, yeah. for sure. His voice was great. Yep. Lyrics are strong. The, the music is good. Yeah, like, you got to give a lot of credit to Joey, the other guy, because a lot of this stuff came together as a group or they wrote together. Uh, but yeah, Gurley, uh, super talented guy and uh, tremendous guitar. When I, you know, I had had, I got started in the music business before this. I had a publishing deal when I was, you know, like 20 years old and I was a songwriter myself and I had a different partner and we were, I was writing songs at Warner Chapel and trying to get, you know, Whitney Houston to cut my songs. Never got anything cut. But when I heard these guys, so I got a call to, to come and jam with them. And um, I went down there not really looking to join a band. But when I heard what they were doing, I was like, well, this, this shit is killing, you know? I mean, I'm going to, I basically told my partner, like, look, we're done. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm doing it with these guys. And sure enough, within six months, I mean, the thing was on the radio, you know? I mean, we had a record deal and it was happening. Um, and Gurley was a huge part of that. I mean, he was a, really a singular kind of voice on the guitar. I haven't really heard anybody. He loves Stevie Ray Vaughan and Hendrix and all those guys, and it's all in there. But the way he kind of reinterpreted it was his own thing. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I know nothing about music, but I was just driving my pickup truck on. Yeah, Man, well, these guys, that's what it's. I mean, that's that's what it's sound supposed to be. really good. Yeah. Like yeah. a lot, you know, because at that time there's still a lot of junk that's being played mm. on the radio at and that time, at all times. <laughs> but I mean, maybe we stood a chance in the early '70s right. when you just go from Crosby, Stills and Nash right. to the Who and yeah, the yeah. Beatles or something. That's but right. they had still some remnants of. Some you know flock of seagulls and look bad late eighties right. junk it just just embarrassing junk and was, then seven horse so you guys had uh well, I was just talking about this movie with Ben and Byron the Wolf of the Wall Street uh, you guys are basically like one of the themes yeah. of that movie yeah. like compare that to having a song played on the radio having your song played on a Scorsese movie yeah I mean the radio is still. Uh, you know, it's still pretty cool. The ra when, especially in those days. I mean, when we heard our song on the radio back in the 90s, it meant something. The radio's not what it used to be, obviously. Uh, Scorsese, though, is what he always was. And, and uh, that was super cool, especially because, um, you know, the, the movie Casino is kind of like a home movie to me. My dad's in it. 
he, oh, he, really? he has a cameo in Casino. He's in the count room, you know, counting down. Oh, money. when they're when they busting want, the guy up. Yeah, well, when they when they take that. Oh, and they're pushing shot, it through. Yeah, yeah, and the guy comes in to take money out. My dad's in there counting down, uh, counting down three thousand dollars because that's what he really did for a living. So we may be the only father son duo that has <laughs> appeared in a Scorsese movie and has a song in a different Scorsese movie. Maybe I bet. maybe yeah. Guinness wants to call me on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was. I mean, that movie. Uh, uh, that came out of nowhere, and uh, yeah, that's uh, we've been dining out on that one for years now. You know, for, yep. good. For when I when I tell my friends that we're playing with Seven Horse at the Roxy, they always say, "Who's Seven Horse?" Right. And I'm like, "You know who Seven Horse is?" Like, no, I don't. What, you want to bet? Yeah, let's bet five bucks. Okay, you seen the movie <laughs> Wolf of Wall Street? Yeah. Okay, this is Seven Horse, and you know it. You do know. You've it. heard this song. Leo and Margot you. Robbie doing it on a bed covered in money. And this is in the background, which wow. is a thrill for me. You know? Yeah. A thrill for all of us. Yeah. Really. <laughs> this is about, too, in the movie when the wheels just really start to fall off yeah. in the movie. And this, it, it feels to me like they made he made the song longer. He did, you know. <laughs> That's you. Uh, here I come. I got it. Come on to this song. How do how, how do you find this? How do you find it? Oh, yeah, you know that's a great question, and we I, we never got an answer to that. We tried to, to like how did this happen? Because literally, we got an email one day out of the blue from an attorney representing. Basically, the email came to my partner Joey because Joey from Dada and I are Seven Horse. Mm -hmm. So uh, he gets an email that says, "I represent Martin Scorsese. We'd like to license <laughs> your song. He's making a movie. We'd like to." And, and Joey sends. He's like, "Is this real?" Report. This he's spam. completely out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he basically is like, "Is this a phishing scam?" They didn't ask for my social security number, but if they mm -hmm. did, I wouldn't be surprised. And I, you know, uh, I'm here in town, so I did a little checking, and sure enough, Scorsese is making a movie. And and, and initially. They asked to license like 14 minutes of the song because it was, you know, he had the movie was six hours long at that point. He's, he's mm -hmm. in the process of cutting it. And so we don't know how much he's going to use, if he's going to use it, but we want to lock up, you know, 14 minutes of it. Will you approve this? And how much do you want for it? And, uh, and I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, what do you, yeah, well, what, well, what do you go off ask? of? Well, I'm So I start making phone calls like, who can tell me what to ask for this? Because mm -hmm. I really didn't have a lot of experience in sync licensing. And this was a, a decade ago when it wasn't as uh, prevalent uh, in the consciousness of musicians as it is now. Because now it's the only way we make any money. Um, so I start calling around and people are like, well, you could ask for this or you could ask for this. And the spread was like this wide. And they all said, but if you come in too high, they're going to pass and you'll never hear from them again. So right. don't fuck it up. Right. And uh, so I, I kind of like, I'll shoot for the middle. And, uh, you know, little did they know, we probably would have given it to them for free. Right. But I asked them for X amount of dollars and they went, okay, that's perfect. And so uh, then we found out later we got the trailer uh, as well, which is a separate piece of business. And uh, we didn't even know, I mean, it took months before we knew that we were even in the movie. And, um, you know, at one point I asked, well, can we come to the premiere? And they were like, <laughs> that's <laughs> never going to happen. And uh, we could not find out, you know, whether it was uh, the music supervisor, uh, Robbie Robertson had a role to play in the music. on this. Oh, he, he did from the he, band. Yep. Did he hear it? Uh, you know, a lot of times what will happen is uh, an editor who's actually cutting stuff will drop a song in there as a temp track. Yeah. And right. the director ends up liking it and is like, well, let's yeah. just use that. Yeah. The, that I've done this a little bit. They drop, right. they just drop something in that they like, that they think fits. And it's sort of like when you get a dog and you go, uh, well, we're going to, we're going to name him Bodie, but that's not going to be his real name. But right. well, when the kids come back from yeah. camp, they'll want to name the dog or whatever. And you call him Bodie for like a week. And then you go, he looks like a Bodie, doesn't he? Look at him. And then you go, that works. So right. You watch a scene enough with the slugged in temp track in there and you start to get used to yeah, that. And you go, that works right. for that. I don't even know what, if it does or if it doesn't, but yeah. you start to like it. Hey, Dawson, what was that third Dada song I told you to highlight that was just selfishly? Probably the Merry Sunshine. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one, too. But I was Open like, tuning. 
I haven't heard that one in so long. I was like, I don't even remember what this song is. I just remember seeing the title. Merry Sunshine Rain. Who are the bands you guys toured with? Well, Sting was the biggest tour we did. That was, you know, courtesy of Miles Copeland, uh, the president at IRS, Sting's manager at the time. The record starts getting hot, and um, we were out there, you know, slugging it out in clubs, and then we get a call like, okay, you guys are doing the world with Sting. Mm. Uh, Get ready to go. (laughs) And uh, the first show on that tour was the Berkeley Greek Theater, never forget it. Um, Because we had played in front of, I think, 500 people maybe was the max. And uh, we're up there in, in uh, Berkeley getting ready to go out. And they've got us in a tent back, backstage. And we're just, you know, we're just like giddy back there getting ready to go do this thing. And then all of a sudden there's Sting. He pops in. And he's, he's like in the yoga days. So he's mm-hmm. almost naked. Mm-hmm. He's got the little white underwear on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and you're just in shock to see him. And uh, then you go out there to, you know, it was early, but still there were thousands of people out there. And we did five, uh, four nights at the Greek Theater here, which was an experience I'll never forget because I was living in town. So I rode my motorcycle up the loading dock. Wow. And walked onto the stage at the Greek Theater, which was really cool. Um, so, yeah, it was really, uh, that was an amazing tour, all of the U.S. and in Europe with him. We, we did, uh, we toured with Crowded House in uh, the U.K., which was great. Um, we played with Depeche Mode in a soccer stadium in Portugal. Uh, and little did we know, though, that we were on the radio in Portugal. So when we came out, everybody oh, yeah. knew us. Wow. Which was, which was amazing to hear them like singing dim in, right. you know, in, in, in Portuguese. Um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was a whirlwind time and uh, a great time there in the early 90s. And we, uh, we, 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 we did a lot. But you guys were such a tight band and the musicianship was so strong that you probably weren't phased by opening for a guy like Sting no. or playing in front of a huge crowd. No, we went out for blood, man. We were ready Good. to kill. And we did. I mean, we, we, I hear from a lot of people who are like, yeah, you, you know, I mean, they, they, this is not true, but they do say you guys blew Sting away. It's like, no, we didn't. I, mean, uh, I saw Sting back in the day. He turned everything into a fucking reggae song, which <laughs> bothered the well, shit. Yeah, I mean, you know, to, for would, me, it was like this, the, the song would, list, though, it's all hits. Yeah, yeah, it's all hits. It's all hits. But That's it's all cheap. Bob yeah. Marley's greatest hits. Because he turned <laughs> every, he would turn Here Comes Santa Claus into a reggae. Yeah, no, he did so like he that. did. He got so bored with his version, right. the album version of it, that he just turned everything into a reggae Wait, what, Mary what? Sunshine and Ryan. Okay, Ryan I'm trying Sunshine. to remember what song this is. I just remember thinking, remember I liked it a lot. All right, go to the middle part. Let's see. I remember... Uh, well, I got here a little more. I missed that. You don't have to miss him anymore, Adam. I know. It's about to happen. You know, I and know. a lot of it because of this show, to be honest with you, because of the... The, the shout outs and I mean there's a hardcore fan base for Dada that has never left and always wants it and it, and, and, it, and in a lot of ways has been you know it, it, it's hard to, to start a new thing when you're like 40 and uh, do a whole new band and create a whole new audience especially when you've got your old audience just constantly going yeah but but what about you know we want the other thing and so you know I spent decades trying to keep this thing alive. I mean, uh, booking shows, booking tours, which led into the 25th anniversary tour in 2017. And, um, but it, it's hard to keep it going and people go in different directions. But this thing of uh, playing the music on, you know, talking about the songs and whatnot, um, uh, coupled with a hardcore audience that still wants it, uh, led to a conversation between the three of us, a Zoom meeting a couple of months ago, uh, in which um, I just asked Gurley, like, look, man, we're playing at the Roxy, uh, because we'd all been aware that you guys were talking about the song. And I said, look, man, you know, maybe there's more, there's still more for us to do. And uh, why why don't you come out and just get up for a, for a number or two? And he was like, well, you know, and it's always a push and pull to get people to agree to do anything. It's like so hard to do things. Um, but he was like, well, if I'm going to come out, uh, I want to do a whole set. And I was like, well, okay, right. done. You right. know, now I got you. So you're going to have to rehearse for that? Or- yeah, we're going to rehearse for it. Um, I mean, I'm already working on it. I'm playing along with this stuff at home right now, Just, but it's in there still. It yeah. never goes away. Um, so we're going we're, we're gonna to rehearse for a few days in North Hollywood before, before the show. That's where all the... 
studios are. That's where it all happens. Yeah, I loved I. So my thing is like I always loved Dada because I sounded so full, and then I always hated In Excess because they all <laughs> sound like a demo tape to me. Like there was missing pieces or something. In Excess songs sound like demo tapes. Like they all sound to me like oh, this is a good start. Now, once you guys fill it out, it'll be a good song. And it was like, and now this is it. Could have stacked this some is, vocals this in is, that, yeah. This is it. But I have no fucking... That Ball Brian's favorite band is in excess. Actually, the Beastie Boys in excess. Those two. Those are my two least favorite. I don't look at the Beastie Boys as a band. Right. That's, that's the worst I can... It's like... I think they did play instruments, though, right? At did some they? point. Yeah. At some point, yeah. which is the claim to fame. Right. They're seventh yeah. down. They, they actually pick up. I mean, compared to what's happening now, that's well, like, you know, you're, you're on the all-star team. You, you, you may be right. This show, Hot Summer Night, that'll be at the Roxy in West Hollywood. That's right. And uh, that'll be August 19th. August 19th. And we're going to say hello to uh, the rebirth of Dada and also uh, Seven Horse and obviously Mike Dawson and the Smoke and Kills is going to be there as well i'm all over the place i'm uh vegas and i'm portland and i'm um uh, appleton wisconsin and where are my dates wait this Those date are your is dates. august 19th where am i gonna be i guess i could be there Keep all right out i'm there, coming man. you better get down there i gotta get down Adam there carol is gonna be there all right that's right because you don't know i mean you know you know every time we get out there it could be the it last could be the really, last i mean would you, would you're you like the human stick of dynamite it could you don't know i mean <laughs> the bands are would you be interested in introducing Dada? I would. I got to check my schedule. Sometimes there's crazy well, shit up you, there, if, but I would. If you are there, you, the mic is yours, man, of course. We'd be honored to have you. Well, I may be out. singing along well, whatever. with your dad. You can do, do whatever you have you to do. Also, <laughs> you could also, you also return the favor and introduce me for the first time in 20 years. That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Turn about the fair play. <laughs> Phil Levitt, everybody. Um, thanks, Phil. Always Thank great you, to see you, my friend. You, man. And until next time, Adam Crow for Phil Levitt and Kirk Cameron and Chris McSpada saying mahalo. <laughs>